ten more seconds. Once again, please don't worry. We haven't filled everything out. We're going to start with noticings. And so we're just going to go around in a circle. Um, if your noticing already got taken, it's okay to say it again. Um, or if maybe you didn't come up with one, maybe you're going to collect a few. Okay. Everybody good with this? Maisie, you want to start us? Um, sure. Um, this is probably one that a lot of people mentioned. But just the indent of a line and like how far they are and the different distances between them through the wow. Um, I talked about how every almost every other stanza starts with ask me if. Oh yeah, mine was the same. It was like how there was like I think it's four times in the thing it goes back to this ask me if and I will tell you or I will speak. Great. Well, I noticed the same thing as Nancy that the, and I kind of said that the indented lines, um, if you read them on their own, they kind of seem to tell their own story. Wow. Um, I noticed that it says I speak seven times in the poem, kind of, kind of like the ask me thing, like, it just repeats that a lot. Mm -hmm. that like even though there is punctuation in the poem like each line break kind of has its own punctuation and it like kind of acts as a comma or like emphasis on the word um i noticed just like the use of i speak and just i just noticed what ella said like the different lines telling like a different story Similar to Hazel, I noticed the theme of spinelessness in animals and in nature in general. Yeah, I think with line breaks, it would be in this like, emphasis or a repeat, but also in a different way. Um, I think just like trying to say an idea, but in a different way and just um, giving different perspectives. That's called a progression of thought. That's a really important thing to notice about a poem, is the progression of thought. Right. All right. So, um, we just heard a lot of really good ideas, and I'm opening the table up for someone to maybe think about what we just heard. Does anybody hear something that they, that they thought we should, that we should tackle first about the structures that we've been talking about? Repetition that I speak, the repetition of ask me if. I, I um, like how I kind of said ask me if, and I know a lot of other people did. I was just wondering, like, one question I had is, like, who's asking me? Thing was um, like 
really interesting contrast between the rest of the poem. So she's talking about nature and like, you know, the breeze and jellyfish and like all these other animals and like animals don't sit in a cubicle, you know? So it kind of made me think like, how do, how does like human life relate to this? And then I feel like us as like humans, we think like all these little like spineless or like backboneless animals are like, you know, like you'd step on an ant with no problem. <laughs> it's like things like that. Um, but like how do humans perceive nature and like the millions of lives that are in nature and how do we see that that's different from our own? It's kind of what I was I think that line symbolizes like the the contrast between the animals and the people, I guess. Just like the different levels of society and like how we view people as like less than us and how like I feel like you should kind of unpack those lines, 16 and 17, a little bit more, because like that whole section kind of confuses me. Like, what part of your nature drives you when you're too to off to understand and filter and filter and filter all day? Like, I don't really know what's, you know, what part of your nature, like who's in the cubicle, what they're filtering. Like, I just, I feel like there's a lot of questions surrounding that, and I feel like it's a super important line. Like, I don't know, maybe we should think about what that's like talking about a little bit. Yeah. Um, connecting to you, Ellie, when it says like filter and filter and filter all day, like I talk about this throughout all the poem, but like who is the I? Like who is, like it's saying I filter and filter, is that like the author? Is she acting as herself or is she in like the animal point of view or like the nature point of view? I think she's in the nature's point of view from what I like read it as. Yeah, it's, it seems, I wonder if like the you is like a, a um, human perspective and then it's like the human sitting in the office and not like understanding the snail and then I don't know what the filter and filter was. But, uh, I thought that um, in 17 kind of like the lines that you when they do things that seem so lifeless, like the in the cubicle, but for some reason see something like a snail or something <coughs> like a bug is just as much of life. I really want to draw our attention to lines 18, 19, and 20. Um, it says, ask me if I speak for the nautilus and I will be silent as the nautilus shell on a, se shell, on a shell. I can be beautiful and useless if that's all you know to ask of me. I also would love to focus on that, but I want to, I don't want to drop Bill up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I was about to say Phil. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to drop Phil's, uh, Bill's, I don't want to drop Ben's <laughs> question about what does it mean that the humans filter and filter and filter, or is right. it the, I, I think that's still an important thing, so we'll hold on to Al, and, but what about this filter? Filter and filter. If you look at that again, could um, could you read those two that, those two lines, sixteen and seventeen, to us? Yeah. Um, what part of nature drives you? You and your cubicle ought to understand me. I filter and filter and filter all day. speak for these animals, but I think she's like using the sort of mindset of the animals as a way to guide her own life, like she's free because she can be like these spineless creatures, she doesn't need, like everybody else is restricted by their mindsets and they're sitting in a cubicles in their society, but she's free because she's just I wonder if it's the opposite, if she's um, connecting the two, um, so like mindlessly working in a cubicle, 
And then also like animals or like any other said ants or something, like working all day. Also, maybe not so much as mindlessly, but um, just consistently working and working. And I feel like just with you and your cubicle ought to understand me. Um, I feel like I like the cubicle part is like humans having like very structured lives and like it's like thing after thing whereas like in nature it's just kind of free and you can kind of just do whatever. Yeah, I think kind of adding on to what you just said and also going back to what Rowan said about humans like going about not really thinking about all these small animals and kind of what I wrote for my characteristics is like um, even like these animals are small and like might not seem like oh I really need this ant in my life but um, like they do have a meaning if it, even if like they don't have something like a giraffe that has like a really long neck and you notice it or something. Um, I'm just like wondering if this like whole thing has like a deeper meaning than just animals and nature and the contrast between humans and nature. I guess I have a kind of similar question. I was wondering like um, how does like humans perception of like what's life like impact how they see these animals? Mm. How does human perception Oh, how does human perception of what like meaningful life is impact how we view these animals and us? And like, kind of like what Naomi was saying, like, can, can we apply that to other areas? Um, I think we can see that in like lines 25 through 27, where it kind of mentions that cubicle idea again. And it says, you with the candle burning and only one chair at your table must understand such wordless desire. And I think like all humans in life kind of desire success and like maybe that, just kind of that idea of success and they don't, like you think us and animals kind of have like that wordless desire between us. But I think like, <laughs> I think I think Quinn brings up something really important here, um, and I think we're all working towards it. But I'm I'm wondering um, if this idea of you with the candle burning and only one chair at your table must understand such wordless desire is the desire for success. What is what is the desire? In line, in line 21 where it says, ask me what I know of longing, and the rest of that section, I think, you with the candle burning and only one chair at your table is, it's, it feels lonely. Like there's only one chair at your table. It's like you're missing another person and you're also maybe missing a purpose in your life. That's, that's how um, I kind of interpret it more as like, especially with only one chair at your table, that to me definitely signifies that like the wordless desire that we all have is to feel to feel loved or to feel like we're we have a community of like supporting family or friends or that type of thing. And I think that I don't I'm still piecing together how it ties into these animals, but I think that's kind of what she's saying is the universal. Like this is what we all want. And that's kind of why it's the the wordless part was interesting to me, that like, not everyone names it, but it's just kind of something that we carry with us. It's interesting. I wonder if maybe, is she saying that the animals, like, are not, they don't have loneliness as much, like, because, maybe because their lives are less structured, they are able to have companionship. Let's read the poem again, then. It's a really excellent question. Ben's wondering if, if she's saying, are the animals less lonely? I think it would be good to hear the whole thing one more time and, and see if we can come up with an answer to some of these questions. Okay. Um, would someone like to volunteer to read this 
from beginning to end. Maybe Hazel, you'd like to do that. Would you like to do that? You don't have to. But. Okay. I can do it. Thank you, Alan. Should I read the epigram? Mm -hmm. uh, it's really important to read both the title and the epigram. Characteristics of life. A fifth of animals without backbones could be at risk of extinction, says scientists. BBC Nature News. Ask me if I speak for the snail, and I will tell you. I speak for the snail. Speak of unearthedness and welcome of mosses, of life that springs up, little lives that pull back and wait for a moment. I speak for the damselfly, water ski, mollusk, the caterpillar, the beetle, the spider, the ant. I speak from the time before spinelessness was frowned upon. Ask me if I speak for the moon jelly. I will tell you one thing today and another thing tomorrow, and I will be as consistent as anything alive on this earth. I move as the current moves with the breezes. What part of nature drives you? You, in your cubicle, ought to understand me. I filter and filter and filter all day. Ask me if I speak for the Nautilus, and I will be silent. As the Nautilus shell on a shelf, I can be beautiful and useless, if that's all you know to ask me. Ask me what I know of longing, and I will speak of distances. Between meadows of night blooming flowers, I will speak. The impossible hope of the firefly. You with a candle, burning, and only one chair at your table must understand. Such wordless desire, wordless desire. To say it is mindless is missing the point. One day she'll say that she speaks for the moon jelly, and one thing, one day she'll say that she doesn't speak for the moon jelly. And she's kind of connecting that to the inconsistency of everything alive on the earth. And I feel like that was kind of like talking about how nothing is really consistent, and like everything's just kind of like, especially in nature, like everything just kind of does whatever it wants. And there's like different patterns, but it's kind of all very inconsistent, and there's not a lot of structure. And I feel like saying like one day I'll tell you that I do, one day I tell you that I won't, is connecting to the inconsistency that we see in nature. I think also looking at the line right below that on 15, how it says I move as the currents mm -hmm. move with the breezes. I feel like Ellie also just touched on what Ben was asking before we read it again about like nature and animals having like not as much of a structured life. So kind of how you're saying how nature has like a pattern, but it's kind of inconsistent, how like not all the breezes are at the same time. So the eye is like moving in like the nature pattern. Something that I think we're really doing is like comparing nature to our own lives and like the lives of things in nature. But for me, this poem really stressed that like humans and our lives aren't really that different from the lives of like the animals she's describing in nature and the patterns. And so I'm just wondering like, are our lives that different or that like differently structured or are they just like that because that's the way that it is, you know? Like, are we that different from nature? This, this ties back to the question that Rowan has asked mm -hmm. actually, which is why we stopped to read the poem again. Mm -hmm. um, is this really about human perception about what makes a life meaningful? And I'm paraphrasing. And, and Mikey, you had something you wanted to say as well at the same time, so I just want to make sure that we get that in there. Going back to what Ben said about 
being lonely and companionship is maybe are humans lonely and lacking purpose in life because our society has this like rigid structure of you know get a job go to work work all day and you don't have time to do anything else but like all these spineless animals they don't have that structure they're just, they just go wherever they please they do whatever they want and maybe like it doesn't really talk about animals having friends <laughs> but like maybe they don't feel the need to have like they don't feel lonely all the time even if they don't have like a companion because they have this freedom to do whatever they want could you read lines uh 21 through 24 out loud for us again Distances between meadows of night bloom and flowers. I will speak the impossible hope of the firefly. Could you repeat the question you're asking? Well, Mikey was saying that that in nature there that there is no sense of of longing because they they that there's this he was saying that there's this idea that the that animals in this don't have friends and aren't longing, and I. So you repeat, you repeat it. What 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 did that bring up for you? This twenty one to twenty four. Did it really mean that animals didn't feel longing, but like this the idea of humans having this constant emptiness in their mm -hmm. lives that animals don't have at the same scale. So. Unfortunately, we have to stop right now in order for you to fill this out. But I want to remind you of the epigram. What is the epigram? What happens to a night blooming flower that's over there, and the only other night blooming flower is interrupted by a subdivision, and the other night blooming flower is over there. What happens to uh, those fireflies that are coming out? And they only have one unique signal that they can send. And the other one doesn't exist anymore. They die. What happens to people who sit alone at a table with a f candle? <laughs> I think you have done a beautiful job unpacking this poem, and you can see that we could do a lot more with it, right? So many excellent thoughts and ideas. And, um, and I hope you come back to it, because I think it's a really beautiful poem about, about where we are in our place in the world. What I'd like you to do right now is look again at what your intention was, describe how well you fulfilled it, and on the back, there's actually a place for you to just self-assess here. I'd like you to be honest, but also generous with yourselves. You did a beautiful job. Please don't, don't be cruel to yourselves. I heard many text references. I heard many excellent questions. I heard many excellent theories. Yes. I have one more quick thought to say. Yeah. We were talking about like the structure of the poem, yeah. and we talked about how like those ones that were indented. I noticed when they were indented, they always went towards the right. But then line 14, that was the only one that went towards the left on this bird. Does that like matter with the poem? Does that like mean anything? I I think that the layout of this poem is absolutely something to notice. And I, and I think actually Mikey said it really well when he said that it's relaxed and fluid and unpredictable. Yes. So using structure to create meaning is, is the art of the poet. And that's a really good one to know. Kind of... So I'd like you to staple them together and put them in the basket when you're done.